Igor Lopatnok, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting. It's yeah, a pleasure. I, I sincerely appreciate you being on today. You, of course, were the director of the 2016 documentary, Ukraine on Fire. And I wanted to speak with you about that a bit today. But just to get a little bit of your background, uh, you actually are originally from Ukraine, correct? Yes, I was born in the Soviet Union. And uh, at the time when I immigrated, it was Ukraine already. So uh, I'm Ukrainian. I'm American citizen from 2015 and uh, living and working in uh, California and Los Angeles. So how did you get involved in filmmaking? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I, my background was uh, in, a, in a big business. So I do a lot of activities in the trade of metals and stocks and currency and uh, investment banking uh, until 2005. In 2005, I already do a lot. And uh, it was start to be boring for me to be in the business when you just counting the counting the numbers so this my dear friend decide to start making the films and then 2005 we established the studio and uh, rent some like place for that buy equipment and start from the production studio so production studio and rental uh, first uh, come to more and more to producing in 2000 Eight, when I was working uh, as a line producer on a numerous projects for Russian uh, movies and for uh, French movie uh, called Transporter Free, Luke Bisson and Jason Statham, I was advised to move to California because it's a very little opportunity to make movies in the Ukraine. So I did it in 2008 and, uh, and it's worked very well for me. I... I definitely, Los Angeles, it's a place when the movie maker is supposed to be if they want to make films. From this time until 2013, I make a lot of projects with the restoration of old famous film, uh, converting them to color and, uh, and do conversion from, uh, from the flat picture to 3D picture. And also producing the uh, few feature films. Uh, we did it one about Ukrainian Chernobyl disaster in the, with uh, Olga Kurulenka in leading role and a French director. We film it in Ukraine in Chernobyl zone, actually, not only in a zone, but 75 days. And in 2013, when Ukrainian crisis uh, uh, start unfolding in November, we already was in the project of doing big documentary. But that documentary was not exactly about <clears throat> Maidan, about that coup, what happened in Ukraine, but about Ukrainian politics and who is who in Ukrainian politics. So as soon as the violent actions and start happening on Maidan, we decide to change the course of our documentary and dedicate every our attention to what's going on in the streets. So when the, the, the apex of this was in the February, 18 February 20, 2014, we have a lot of material gathered from, from the streets. And we start cutting this. We did also one, our short film, Maidan Massacre, when we investigate uh, from the point of view of, you know, the criminal stage investigations, criminal, uh, like a CSI style of film, when we investigate the ballistics of these killings and uh, come to very interesting conclusion, very controversial on this time. So this was no proof that the government forces and police forces was killing the protesters. And it was direct proof that protesters was killing police and even killing themselves. That movie got the international award and released in 2014 at the Siena International Film Festival. This on our Rumble channel, if somebody interested. And it's a short film, 57 minutes. And we, we keep working on the Ukrainian fire. And I understand that we needed some big name to amplify. So this is how I come to Oliver Stone in his office. And, uh, and he liked the idea. He said, but we need a director. You producer, you not a director. And we start looking for director. 
because he already was to lend his name as an executive producer and help to make a movie big, but he was not ready to direct. Mm. And this time, as I believe, he was his big feature film about. Um, oh, okay. I will. I will not touch this. He was like one project was on put on hold, and he was he have a free time, but the decision was made because I worked with his good friend producer Moritz Borman who was producing the Alexander for Oliver and, and, and Snowden uh, in 2016 when we also was involved. So the Oliver asked Moritz about me and we worked together with Moritz on the project of famous Russian director Andrew Konchalovsky was called uh, Nutcracker and the Red King in 2011. So the Moritz tell him Igor is okay and uh, I, was, I was cleared and we start working and sooner or later Oliver tell me that you know what you need to direct that film yourself because nobody knows the situation in Ukraine better you read two languages you speak Russian you speak Ukrainian and uh, and you need to direct it uh, yourself so this is how uh, I start directing that movie you know my my passion to history was not only because I do the famous historical films and do a lot of research for my restoration work and colorization work. My mother also was a teacher of history in the high oh, school. Really? So, yeah, so the history, it's like something that fascinates me and reading the books, historian books and studying, and especially uh, try to make from the puzzle something like bigger picture. So to understand what is going on behind what is the moving uh, driving factors for the situation. So this is why our Ukrainian fire was such an educational film because we, do, we did some excursions to the history of Ukraine. Uh, we tried to explain why Ukraine is divided country and why and where is the roots of this uh, uh, radical nationalism leaning. And I, I think it's, it's work. We released the film 2016 in uh, Italy, in Sicily, uh, a film festival called Armina uh, Film Fest with, uh, with an award so the, for best documentary. And uh, it's, uh, we was not competing, we was not com in a competition, but they give us a special award as a recognition for our input and for, for importance of this film. Oliver was here as well. So we have a good time and we start selling the film 2017. We released it in the United States in February and it was everywhere until uh, we, we did 2019. We did a sequel called Revealing Ukraine. We find uh, the possibility to interview uh, Mr. Putin again. And we also speak to very hard in the position, leader of opposition in Ukraine, Viktor Medvedchuk. So in 2021, we did a film what's called Ukraine, 30 Years of Independence, The Everlasting Present. That's a long title and very sad film, feature like more than two, like practically two hours, uh, feature documentary. And we interview a lot of uh, people from the Ukraine as in the president of Ukraine, 2004. 2004, 2008, uh, Viktor Yushchenko, couple of prime ministers, and uh, Viktor Yehanurov and the Pustavokhin Kayaza. So we, we talked to everyone. We talked to the pro Russians leaning and pro Ukrainians people. So we, we, we hear to everyone. But we also was concentrating on where is the role of United States in this, uh, all these events. And, 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 and what, the, what the result uh, of the 30 years of independence from Soviet Union time when, when Soviet Union collapsed, what Ukraine is achieved. And it was very sad to, to do, you know, to understand that achievements is very bad. It's very, you cannot break these achievements. So more than around 10 million people leave Ukraine, emigrate. So the official data for this just last eight years was a six million people who leave Ukraine behind. One of them is me. And they, they do it not because they don't love the country. They did because 
that it was impossible to live and to exist under more and more, how to say, unpleasant uh, pressure. And Ukraine was very much Russian speaking country and the Russian, this is the first language in the family, it's not the second. And most populated areas leaning on the east of country, so they speak Russian, they not speak Ukrainian. Ukrainians that mostly in the villages and in, in the west of the country. So well, let's, let's, <clears throat> let's go through the history of it. Um, yeah. Just to, again, for a lot of folks in the U.S., I think that they're not really familiar of the relationship between Russia and Ukraine over the years. Of course, both countries were part of the Soviet Union. Prior to the formation of the Soviet Union, was Ukraine part of Russia? Interesting things. The Ukraine do not, do not exist as an as a independent state before they start existing as a part of Russia. So the current borders of Ukraine was crafted during the Soviet time in the very beginning. So the first independence of Ukraine from the, oh, first of all, the, the founder of Ukrainian state, we can call the great political leader Bogdan Khmelnytsky, in the, in the 17th century, when he was in, at war, he was a leader of uh, that formation of on a, on a right uh, part of the river of Dnepr, in the Zaporozhye, and it's called Sich. That's when Cossacks live, the Zaporozhsky Kozaki, as, as it in Russian. And it was a movement, like a very, like, you know, a primitive democracy when they rule themselves. And uh, they was fighting against the Crimean Tatars on this time, because uh, the Crimea was under the uh, uh, Ottoman Empire rulings. And they fighting with a uh, Dredge uh, Pospolita, what was uh, the big country, and when it's current uh, Poland uh, and uh, Eastern European country sitting, it was a big formation, including part of Russia and the Baltic states and the Belarus as well. So they fight on two fronts, and uh, when they suddenly change in the sides, alienate both of them, and it was under the threat of elimination from the uh, Tatars and, uh, and the Polands. So they strike the peace with the Russian Tsar and they ask, they ask the Russians to accommodate them as a part of Russian empire. And it was hard decision for the uh, Russian empire, but they agreed what's lead Russia immediately to the war with Rzhech Kaspalita because they need to protect their new allies. So Ukraine is a borderland. Through that borderland, all invasion come to Russia. When the Napoleon advanced in the 1820, 1812 to the, to the uh, Russian capitals, he go through Ukraine and through Belarus. So when, the, when Hitler was advancing during the World, World War II, World War I also, I believe, right? Yeah, World War I, World War I as well, the Ukraine was, uh, it's more like a more like in Belarusian, but Ukraine was also affected. And 300 years after that uh, actions of Bogdan Khmelnytsky, Ukraine was part of the Imperial uh, Russian Empire. And, and you know what? The, Everything was even that such a famous poets or writers, Ukrainians, they was educated in St. Petersburg in the capital. They speak both languages, they know both languages and they benefited from the culture because Russian culture is much bigger and Russian language is much more used and they open up the world uh, culture for Ukraine. So to study the the Goethe and the, and, the, and the other philosophers and the, and the poets and the writers, Ukrainians use the Russian language. And Russia as well, very heavy invest in development of the country, especially during the Soviet time. So let's go back to the uh, World War I and after the World War I, the big cataclysmic event hit the Russian empire and that uh, was a revolution in the October of 1917 in St. Petersburg. And that's ended up the war because, uh, by, by the way, it's interesting similarity because we see the, the signs of color revolution during the, that 
communist revolution in Russia because Germany was very much interested to make the regime change in the imperial Russia because they want Russia leave this war. Because with, with Russia, there was no chance for Germany to win. And they do whatever they can. They finance Vladimir Lenin. They give him a very good finances. They even transport him from the Switzerland in a wagon to the Russia, through the border of Germany. And the Germany was at war with uh, Russia at this time. So they was desperate to make a regime change in, and, they, and they succeed. That's lead to the brest litovsk peace agreement when the Soviet Union, Soviet Republic already give up the Ukrainian territory and Ukraine announced independence in 1980, uh, what exists only for 18 months. They was under German protectorate and the Germany experienced the communist revolution themselves. And, uh, and, uh, and Germany uh, retreat from Ukraine and Ukraine after a few years of turmoil fall to the, to the Red Army because Red Army and, the, and a popular movement of uprising and the, the dictatorship of proletariat was on the rise. So Ukraine founded as a Soviet Socialist Republic and was a member of four states who signed the Union Agreement for the Soviet Union in 1921, in December, this year we will, uh, 1922, I'm sorry. This year, this is a 100 year anniversary of Soviet Union. And some people who is, who is uh, doing historical research, they said that Putin trying to restore the uh, Soviet Union 2.0. They completely out of touch with reality. They say but, that, or the Russian Empire. That's... Or the Russian Empire, yeah, because yeah. Russian Empire borders was even bigger than the Soviet Union. It's a too big myth existing that Stalin uh, killed a lot of civilians in Ukraine during the so-called event Holodomor. That was a famine in the in the Soviet Union in the 1932-1933. Famine was caused by the infection was uh, what was hurting uh, uh, the wheat very badly, like modern health was uh, dying. And the Soviet Union agriculture system was very advanced because they, they started to do these collective farms that they can make big industrial scale production. The, the agricultural scientists from United States visiting to Soviet Union to study their uh, advances and their experience. And so as soon as famine started, of course, of course, the West, the collective West, who was not recognizing Soviet Russia, they jump on this and they blame Stalin, killing his own people, especially Ukrainians, artificially you know, artificially causing the, the suffering and uh, and they jump on this. And that was propaganda from the beginning. I have a numerous, uh, uh, the historical works of American scientists, American professors who is uh, scholars from United States whom hard to believe they working for Stalin because they live in now, who study that question and who find out that's all science of using this as a tool in the propaganda. On the other side, Soviet Russia developed such a lot of industry in Ukraine, heavy industry, especially in the area of Donbas. And during the Soviet time, Donbas was included in the territory of Ukraine because before that, it was not the part of Ukraine that was a part of Russia. And uh, is that why also, there's so many ethnic Russians in the Donbass? Yeah, practically, yes, the practically because it's a, like not only ethnic Russians, but people who speak Russian language. You know that we never call them. We never like feel like about ourselves when we live in the Soviet Union about as about Ukrainians. We feel about we are the Soviet people. We live in the Soviet Union. This is our country, and this artificial borders, national borders. That was a big mistake of communist leaders because. That's produced the possibility to inflict the international, like an international conflict when one nation hate each other. But that was strictly prohibited in the Soviet Union and Soviet Union 
you know, propagate and, and move to establish the friendship from the different nations. And it's worked pretty well. It's worked pretty well. During the World War II, when Hitler invited Soviet Union, he was not attacking Ukraine. He was attacking Soviet Union. He go through Ukraine, of course. And Ukrainians fight in a Red Army against Hitler. But after that, country was, like Republic was uh, occupied and go under occupation for the three years from 1941 to 1943-44. So practically half of Ukrainians was collaborating with the Nazi regime. And collaborating not only, I like, you know, how to say, going to war. They collaborating actively. So they form a divisions and military divisions called Roland Battalion, called Galicia, and called Nachtigall. What is uh, yeah, it's a bird on the on the, uh, in the German language. So just, just out of curiosity for uh, for why yeah. they were collaborating, um, was this really about Ukrainian nationalism, like harking back to the 17th century? Was this about anti-communism? Was this about the appeal of fascism? Was this a combination? This is a very good question, very deep. First of all, the Western part collaborate because they want independent state, Ukraine, and they think this is a chance when the Hitler can help them to remove the Stalin from power. So they choose and decide whom they believe much powerful first. Second, they share the ideology. Because if you look at the ideology of Ukrainian nationalism, you can see that exactly the same paradigm what in the Nazism. So the exceptional role of one nation over another, ability to call another nation a subhuman. So this is very, very common uh, lining to one to each other uh, ideology. On the Eastern part and the Central Ukraine, Collaboration was mostly can be described, can be explained how do you know that the jealousy of people to someone who is somebody's like a neighbor living better, have a better house and more beautiful wife. And I will, if I betray him and I will point the finger and say he's an enemy of Nazi state, they will take him and I will grab his house. That was uh, unfortunately the bad quality of a lot of Ukrainians, so they were jealous to each other. This is a quality what I believe not reside in the DNA, but it was some kind of a lot of time changing the side during the centuries, choosing the more powerful ally when the when the Europe uh, grow or Russia grow. So they they maneuvering and they. For that reason, they not stand to moral standards, to the moral grounds. They choosing that just to things what better for them now. And they don't thinking about consequences. That's what led to such a lot of collaboration with Nazi during the World War II and Stalin. Stalin, by the way, oh, it's an interesting story about this. Uh, my movie called, title of my film, Ukraine and Fire, that was... Uh, the famous Ukrainian director during the Soviet Union called Alexander Dovzhenko, who, who write the script and call him Ukrainian fire. And Stalin destroyed his completely. He prohibited him to, to make that film happen. He was, uh, he was uh, Dovzhenko wanted to commit the suicide when he talked to Stalin. Stalin invited him to Kremlin and beat him very hard for that script. That script tried to be apologetic to Ukrainians who collaborate with Nazi, explaining them that they have no any other way just to collaborate. No, but, that, but this is not true because it was a lot of partisan movement, rebellious movement, the insurgents during the World War II. It was hundreds of thousands of people living in the forest and fighting Nazi Germany. They have a choice to choose or to go with Nazi or to fight against them. So uh, this is why I call my film Ukraine on Fire, because to study this question, I believe it is very crucial and very important. Mm -hmm. We touch it in our film. So yeah, for, after World, mm -hmm. I, I was going to ask, after World War II, after uh, you know, hostilities came to an end or 
you know, the, the remnants of uh, Banderas groups were, were put down. Uh, from that time until the collapse of the Soviet Union, were these national groups, uh, the nationalist groups active in Ukraine? First of all, a lot of them uh, uh, fled to uh, foreign, foreign states. Uh, I, I meet them in Australia. I meet them here in the United States and in Canada. So they was everywhere. And it was not just, it was a thousand and thousands of people. Actively, uh, that all nationalist movement in Ukraine was ceased to exist in 1956, I believe. And they was practically sitting in the underground and the, and the Red Army used the tanks and used everything to take them out from that, from that forest. Uh, nationalist movement was prohibited in the Soviet uh, Ukraine. There's nobody promoting this until, until the, the independence happened in 1991. The independence happened because the local communist bonza, they want to escape the support of uh, the coup d'etat in August 1991. So the, the independence of Ukraine is, we have a two referendum before, before in 1991. One of them was in April and that it was referendum on, uh, for the Confederate kind of union, new union agreement. And 75, I believe, seven, more than 75% of uh, population of Ukraine would to keep the union with Russia and other republics. After the August coup happened, what I also see a lot of signs of color revolution in this coup, what speed up the collapse of Soviet Union. And in, in December, the Belavezha agreement was signed and Ukraine take a principal role to destroy the Soviet Union, to make it cease to exist. And in December, that's all was come to sign a new agreement we call CIS, Country of Independence, uh, Commonwealth of Independent State, but this never was ratified by Ukrainian parliament and Ukraine never collaborate on a, uh, on a scale of Soviet Union. From this time, Ukrainian nationalist movements start to be fitted, first of all, from abroad, because diaspora spent a lot of money to promote the language. They call it they're promoting the language, and, uh, but under that language, they, they're choosing their use and they're sending them to the summer camps when they start training them. Uh, usual Boy Scout activity, plus a little bit of uh, scent of Ukrainian nationalism. So like, you know, glory to Ukraine, glory to heroes. And that was, you know, this motto was invented, copycatting the high Hitler and the, during the World War II. They need something that separate them, like, you know, like an, login and password. So the greetings of glory to Ukraine, glory to heroes. Heroes was a Bandera and Shukhevich and other ruthless and ultra nationalists who is responsible for atrocities like in the Volinia and uh, other, other places. So that more and more until 2004, there was already established movement when people grow up with that Ukrainian nationalist idea in the heads. And they was ready to fight. And first time they showed the muscles in 2004 during the, the so-called color revolution, orange revolution, with what's lead Viktor Yushchenko to power. And Viktor Yushchenko was very much big supporter of Ukrainian nationalism idea. Under his uh, ruling, he even gave the status of hero of Ukraine to Stepan Bandera, and he allowed a lot of Moments. They he also canceled the the visas for foreigners to visit Ukraine, and at, and in his time, the first time American flag emerged over the special forces of Ukraine headquarters on Vladimirskaya Street, SBU. It's a notorious, notorious special service. They give up their archive archive to CIA officers. They have the CIA and FBI operatives on the ground already, actively working. And when the run, running away prime minister of Ukraine, uh, Pavel Lazarenko, he was run to United States. He was detained and, and served seven years here for corruption. I believe that Pavel Lazarenko gave a lot of information to FBI about who is who in Ukraine, 
and how that elite is constructed and working. So practically to 2004, when the support of color revolution come in tremendous uh, wave of NGO funds and, uh, and others, 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 and they use Soros already because Soros was here from 90s. First on Ukraine, one of the things that many people recognized about you was that you, during the revolutions of 1989, funded a lot of dissident activity, civil society groups in Eastern Europe, in Poland, the Czech Republic. Are you doing similar things in Ukraine? Well, I set up a foundation in Ukraine before Ukraine became independent of uh, Russia. Um, and the foundation has been uh, functioning ever since. And it played a, an important part in events now. His uh, foundation called in Ukraine the resurrection or rebirth, something like that. So they use... They Renaissance, use also, I, I believe. Renaissance, I'm sorry, yeah, Renaissance, yeah. <laughs> uh, they use also the NAD, they use the uh, other funds, and as Victoria Nuland acknowledged, they spent the $5 billion to promote democracy and is another goals. Another goals that mean the regime change and make Ukraine flip. Flip because the idea of after of all that geopolitical conflicts, big Dzerzhinsky about to Ukraine, who was has Ukrainian parents himself, Zbigniew Dzerzhinsky, who was a national security advisor here in the United States, and who was, uh, his book, Great, uh, great Chessboard, that's like, you know, that's like a playbook for everything that's happening now. Because if you read this book, you can see how Bzezinski recommend to give anti-tank weapons to the citizens living in the Kharkiv to fight Russian tanks. So this all things was planned much more in advance because they want to break, they want to drag Ukraine, subvert Ukraine and, uh, uh, and make Ukraine, Ukrainians fight Russians. And it's happening right now. So you mentioned the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy. This is an NGO that is uh, heavily yeah. influenced by the CIA and by the American government. Do you know exactly when the uh, the NED uh, started being active in Ukraine? From the beginning, from the 1991, from the day of independence. Uh, they was more active in the late 90s. It depends who was in the power in the, in the White House. And National Endowment for Democracy, this is a, funded by our budget. So we as an, an estate, we fund them completely. 100% money coming from... Uh, from. We trace in their uh, finances uh, very actively in the 2004 and 2000. 14 as well so they was active all the time they just build up this more and more and ukraine have very loose regulation about the foreign influence on the election so they practically they was everywhere and then in 2008 it was announced that uh, both georgia and ukraine the intent was to have them join nato uh, what can you say about that as far as the, the sentiment uh, within Ukraine? Did they want we, to join NATO? And, and you know, if yeah. they did, why? We, the, when I leave Ukraine in 2008, around 60% was against the joining the NATO of people living in Ukraine. And, uh, but let's understand what's happened with NATO. Why NATO expand the 14 countries to the border of Russia? In 1986, when Gorbachev met with Ronald Reagan in Reykjavik, Gorbachev came with open hands and he want to stop uh, arm, arms racing and he want to stop that Cold War completely. He proposed initially, that was his idea, to dismantle the Warsaw Pact, to demolish the wall in Germany and to destroy the nuclear weapons completely. Of course, together with the United States. Reagan was not ready for this. Reagan was, even if he agreed on this, he would have no authority to destroy the nuclear weapons in the United States. Gorbachev was younger and probably more naive about how the American power is work. So they agreed for the military pacts don't need if we not have a plan to fight each other and we established the coexisting 
practices in the 70s and during the Brezhnev time. And the, the arms race is bleeding economy, especially the Russian economy, the Soviet Union economy was bleeding because of that. So they agreed to dismantle the Warsaw Pact. And Reagan promised to Gorbachev with NATO will be never advance to the borders of Soviet Union. And as until the Gorbachev time it was, but when the Soviet Union collapsed and they never even make it in the writings, that's how that, uh, the history has some recordings about this. We, 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 we possess some papers when that was in writing, it was NATO promising not expand. So, but immediately, as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed and the, and the Baltic states and others and Poland and the, everybody jump on the wagon and so, so on, it's like a 13 countries and it's all close to the border of Russia. Of course, Russia feel threatened because Russia was invaded for more than 15 times for the last 300 years. And it's all the time coming from this place. It's come from the east, during the mongolo tatar invasion, during the Chinggis Khan, but it's all the time coming from the from the from the west and, and, and know, from from NATO member states. I mean, yes, Germany, yes. France, uh, Britain, yeah. the, even the, the number US one of all... number one country. It was a Turkey. <laughs> they did it like a twelve wars with Russia, and they're all the time losing this war. And Russia expand expand the border, but. So but NATO, in that, effect, is like an alliance of countries that have <laughs> invaded Russia. Well, listen, if you if you look at the NATO now, I can compare it only to the Second Reich, because that was also attempt to euro integrate Ukraine and the Belarusia and uh, and the Russia into Europe, but under the under the, uh, the Third Reich umbrella and uh, with no Ukrainians, Belarusians or Russian alive, because they use the tactics of extermination of uh, Slavs because they said that's ex that, that's remind me the current uh, rage of Russophobia in Europe especially when they said there's uh, no Russian cultures allowed it's no time for Dostoevsky it's no time for Tchaikovsky it's complete bullshit that's how that's how the Nazi Germany start when they said when they blaming the Jewish writers Jewish scientists and the and everyone they said they subhumans they would they don't deserve to be in our country. They start exterminations. This is we are on a one step to this in a, in a Europe because Russian people already beaten, Russian people already threatened it, and they. But you know the and Russia has don't forget Russia has under twenty seven million casualties in that World War Two. Uh, practically every family has somebody who was dying during this war. So that's a very personal, uh, the, this feelings against the Nazi scam, it's an, in, embedded in Russian DNA. So, so when you understand this Russian is not allowing this scam to achieve, especially to grow on the border. And what's happened now in Ukraine, 2008, that was an exercise of uh, idea given to Ukraine and to Georgia how to say, hope, chance to join NATO Sundays. They establish the, the partnership program. They start more and more teach uh, to the NATO standards and, uh, and it's not work. It's only give the false hope for Ukrainians for like somebody in NATO going to protect them. So in, in 2013, when the Maidan uh, protest started, did this initially start with any kind of elements of, uh, of these nationalists um, or, you know, of uh, folks who may have been influenced by the U.S. in some way? Or was this really an organic um, protest against the government or in favor of closer ties with Europe? First of all, that was uh, not, not uh, so nationalist in the beginning because that was a power struggle in the beginning. The, the leaders of oppositions want to grab the power. And they was ready to use the methods of color revolution because they see that example 2004. But when they need the muscles to make it uh, violent, then when Ukrainian nationalists and radicals come to their place, C-14, right sector and others was emerged from the demand of Maidan 
for the violent actions. And they was ready to deliver. And they delivered. They was responsible for killing the people to ignite more and more protests. They was people who was hiring on others. And as we know the names, the Andrei Parubi and the, uh, Alexander Turchinov and the, the guy Tagnibok from the right party Svoboda. Now they saying this, this party not present in Ukrainian parliament, but listen, that enablers and uh, who allow the Ukrainian ultra-nationalist radicals who is openly copy-cutting Nazi symbols and putting them on the chevrons as the Azov battalion. And this is not the hundreds, not the thousands. The Azov corpus, like more than 60,000 people, it's a part of Ukrainian military. So this is a part of Ukrainian uh, ideology. And they don't, don't uh, have, they have such an influence over Zelensky because if Zelensky disobey, they're just going to remove him. Well, I, I do want to get to Azov in a minute, but I, again, I just kind of mm -hmm. want to run through the, the chronology of what happened with the, with the um, Maidan yes. uh, revolution. And one thing that I am particularly curious about was uh, in December of 2013, two U.S. senators, John McCain, who was, was a Republican and a famous neoconservative, he traveled there and spoke to the crowd along with Chris Murphy, who was a Democratic senator, and he's actually still a senator from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. People of Ukraine, this is your moment. Narode Ukrainski, it's a wash moment. This is about you, no one else. Tse Pravaz, this is about the future you want for your country. This is about the future you deserve. Tse Pravaz, my budne, pro my budne, vaše Ukraine. Це про майбутнє, на яке ви заслуговуєте. A future in Europe. Майбутнє Європи. A future of peace. Майбутнє мир. With all of your neighbors. Майбутнє всіх ваших сусідів. The free world is with you. America is with you. I am with you. And the destiny you seek lies in Europe. І ваша доля як ми вважаємо, знаходиться в об'єднаній Європі. Україна буде зробити Європу краще, а Європа буде зробити Україну краще. Дякую! 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 Oh yeah, this is like direct uh, interference in the foreign affairs of foreign country, because you, when you imagine if the Russian the, the senators or uh, the Duma members will be somewhere here in Ferguson giving the cookies to the protesters and said, you right to go, go ahead against your government. That's what they did. And the Senator McCain, this is like and one of architects who helped in Victoria Nuland on the ground because he is a well-established uh, and uh, heavyweight senator and the, and the candidate for, for, the pre for the White House who ran for the office. And his presence on the, on the ground, of course, was assuring for the uh, opposition, what they do in something, what can be immediately, if they succeed, immediately validated by United States. And that's happened exactly this. So McCain, and not only McCain, but officially like embassy of United States in, the, in Ukraine, and this time, not only giving direct financial help, so it's like, you know, the plane packed with cash, 20 million of, in a small, notes was delivered to the uh, the kiev airport and was driven to from the airport directly to the embassy and from embassy they given this money to the opposition's leaders to finance maidan because maidan cost around one million a day so that was a costly and it was uh, taking like a more than 100 days that was a very very costly event and as well the jeffrey pyatt who is now ambassador to greece was funny uh, and he survived the Donald Trump tenure. So the, he was also hosting like a headquarter of Ukrainian oppositions. Every communications was supposed to be protected. Every negotiations, critical and sensitive to the leakage, was held on a, on a ground of United States Embassy in Kiev. So he was very much openly involved in a coup. And Victoria Nuland was in a, uh, operative, uh, in a, a, uh, an operative commanding position 
who is discussing with the pirate when this famous leak called whom to appoint to be a prime minister of Ukraine and they called the Yats because he's uh, and they they said Klitschko is supposed to be on the side so that was a coordinated uh, event and the headquarter of Maidan exists not in an opposition uh, party's headquarter but an American United States embassy in Kiev. So um, again, the protests continued on for several months. They they got violent. Police started getting attacked. Uh, eventually, there was a coup, um, and eventually, the uh, the president of uh, Ukraine fled. And something that I, I've you know heard from folks who are supportive of NATO in the West is is saying you know the the leader of Ukraine he fled, so that effectively was handing over um, power to the to the protesters. What, what would you say to that? They were interesting. He fled to the second biggest town in Ukraine, to Kharkiv, because Kharkiv in this time hosting the big conference about the... And he, he already signed every agreement what they demand. He agreed on new elections early in December of 2014. Uh, and, uh, and they signed the peace agreement and uh, Europe validated. It was Frank Walter Stanmeier from the Germany uh, who was a foreign minister of Germany, and it was the guys from France and Poland. Just Russia we stand from this. They signed an agreement with Yanukovych, and they brutally violated, start killing the people and uh, overthrow him. He drive to Kharkiv. His motorcade was under fire by snipers to kill him. Uh, thanks God he take the helicopter. He told it all, all to us directly during the interview in 2014 in December when we met him in Moscow in Oliver Stone interview him for our film. Uh, so Yanukovych not flee the country, but he understand that the goal was not to remove the president from power, but to kill him. And after that, blame him and everything. So he chose not to be Salvador Ali and, uh, and he, he requested help from President Putin and help was granted and they use, I believe, the warship to uh, and the Black Sea to transport him to Russia. After that, the coup removed him from power in unconstitutional way, because the Ukrainian constitution has exactly and very complicated proceeding how to uh, remove the sitting president from power. After that, that's, they appointed Alexander Turchinov interim president. And the Turchinov uh, gave up on the Crimea because he was told by State Department people, do not fight with Russia because all Crimea want to go. And Russia. Let, let, let's talk about that for yeah. a second. And by the way, just yeah. it, it, one thing that I find very ironic is a lot of the people, um, you know, who seem to have no problem with the coup that happened in 2014. They're the ones who, uh, you know, yell loudest about um, what happened uh, January 6th no. here with the, the, mm -hmm. the protests that happened at the U.S. Oh. Capitol, calling that an insurrection. Um, but they have no problem with the, the coup in 2014. Yes. But in regards to Crimea, uh, a couple of things. So first off, I believe what I read is that this actually was historically part of Russia that yes. was given to Ukraine by uh, Nikita Khrushchev as sort of a, a present on the 300th it's anniversary yeah, yeah. Of, of unity, correct? Yes. In so, 1956, and, yeah, or 54, yeah. And then another thing, as far as the annexation, um, you know, this is kind of pitched to the, the West as, you know, Russia essentially invaded Crimea during the, the chaos of what was happening in Ukraine. Uh, the, the Russian military was already there, correct? They have naval bases? Yes. Yeah, that base was uh, they rented uh, to Russia for 100 years, and Russia have a limit of 25,000, and they have a right to move across the Crimea given just a 24 hours notice to Ukrainian authority what they and the move. And the people of Crimea, they mostly Russian speaking, they mostly, uh, and they was afraid, you know, the West start pitching to the Western audience that coup as a revolution of dignity, that the referendum in Crimea as aggression of Russia and uh, hostile takeover and uh, annexation. And they now, they, 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 saying that Russia helping the rebels in the Donbas for eight years and all atrocities what the Ukrainian army commit in the Donbas does not exist in the Western press because nobody talking about this. 
thousands of people who was killed, more than 500 kids during the shelling of Donbass. So this is how that informational influence operation is running. This is how informational war is raging because the, the, the contemporary war is more like fight it in the in an informational area than on the ground. But uh, interesting question. Yeah, Crimea was Russian because Leo Tolstoy was fighting for Crimea and the Sevastopol uh, as an artillerist and the, who is a who is, was in a member of uh, Russian artillery and the, and a, and a black Black Sea fleet of Russia standing here for centuries. So Crimea was Russian territory and it was gifted by Khrushchev to Ukraine just because nobody cared in the Soviet Union about these borders. Right. It's you know, the, it's the same country. Country. It'd be like part of a like, U.S. state Correct. going to yeah. another U.S. state. Yeah. Uh, we did it here for electoral purpose. And, uh, and look, it's very interesting what you see the same people who's forcing the Russia gate in the United States. Same faces. Senator McCain was involved in Chris Steele this year. Victoria Nuland helped Chris to disseminate this dossier in the State Department and, and, and point the finger to the FBI, so officially showing him way when he need to go. So if you study that in details, you will find out such a similarity when the, what's happened in Ukraine with the regime change and what's happened in the 2016, 2020, Ukraine's, Ukrainians participate practically openly. They, uh, they give the, the embassy in the United States direct order to help the Alexandra Chalupa, who was a DNC contractor, who was a lawyer working for uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign and for DNC to prevent a Donald Trump going to be two elections, just to compromise him. And they used the Manafort and Paul Manafort served the year in the jail. This is, uh, so this is very similar and very familiar faces behind Ukrainian events and now. And you can see Biden, of course, who was a supervisor of Ukraine for this from 2014 to 2020. And had that prosecutor and, fired as well? Yeah, they got the prosecutor fired. Hunter was uh, shopping around for the, uh, some uh, revenue from Ukraine, from uh, oligarchs and uh, corrupted uh, Burisma people. So they do a lot of mess in Ukraine. So when we see that all, we, we, we know whom to blame. That people who lead for this war, that people who, who ignite the war. Because the Russia now fighting not for Ukraine. They don't need Ukrainian territory. They're fighting against the military capacity of prob uh, like a, probably the state who's going to attack Russia sooner or later. And they're fighting against that Nazi idea because they cannot stand it. Let, let's and talk about the, the Azov Battalion. Um, mm -hmm. you, you brought them up previously. So is the Azov Battalion the largest nationalist uh, fascist group in Ukraine or is it just one of, of several? That's the biggest uh, officially recognized and incorporated in the structure of Ukrainian military group. What's openly uh, declared the ultra and radical nationalist idea and use insignia of what's a copycat from the Nazi insignia. The, yeah, the answer is yes. It's a lot of others. And you it's said there's about 60,000 of them? Yeah, at my estimate, they have a 60,000 of active members of Azov. Okay. Because one, they can, I, I've, you, I've heard mm -hmm. from people in the West, like there's only a thousand of these folks. No, no. Uh, first of all, when Azov was a battalion in the beginning, then how is all start? Uh, during the announced anti-terror operation by Alexander Terchinov, interim president, who started the war in Ukraine in 2014, they start allowing to form the volunteers in a paramilitary formation called battalions, voluntary paramilitary battalions. It was a bunch of them. Aydar, Azov, Dnepr 1, Dnepr 2, Tornado, I believe more than 15. One of some of them go so so nuts. So even the government of Ukraine 
prohibit them like a tornado and they they catch them because they rape the prisoners they torture in them they 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 run the private private uh, prisons etc etc notorious the azov was picked up by minister of internal affairs chief of police the oligarch uh mr arsen abakov and he made from azov he is first his personal uh, guards. After that, he he's used Azov as his very, like, you know, uh, uh, very trustworthy uh, core of the Minister of Internal Affairs and the National Guards. But practically, all National Guards of Ukraine formed from the, from the battalions. This is the way how they legalize it. How they make them call it not uh, all not all of them call Azov, but all of them the National Guards of Ukraine. So practically, that was an incorporation of paramilitary formation with a radical and a nationalistical and a, and a neo-Nazi ideology into the military. Mm -hmm. So Ukrainians, so they that the leading part, and they give the promotion that was like a lift for them who who support them and make them much more successful in career you just need to say russia is an enemy we're gonna fight them yeah you know it's it's funny too because you hear all these people say well you know there's there's nazis everywhere there's nazis in russia there's nazis in the u.s but you know they're not officially part of the military of like course <laughs> and for, for, for to be a nazi in russia you will serve the the, the term in a jail if you're going to be caught yes the idiots still exist they everywhere but russia has and Russia enforce the law. Russia not allow and not incorporate the Nazi in the in the day, the law enforcement and the militaries. Right. As it would Ukraine, be like in in the U.S. Here, it'd be like if the KKK became part of the United States National Guard. National Guard, yeah. And the, you know, to understand how big is Azov, you need to understand they have an artillery, they have tanks, they have their own air forces, helicopters, and and jets. So this is a big. This is not just a few thousand this is an army can you speak to some of, them, of the the crimes that they've committed over the last eight years oh you know it's it's a long list of the atrocities from the beginning the first of all the biggest crime what they commit in the practically every day they was firing artillery on a donbass on a megapolis it's a heavy artillery 152 millimeters and they fired that jet propelled uh, artillery system on the cities of Donbass. They killing innocent people, people who is not a combatant. They killing civilians just to show there will be no mercy for them when they will go inside. And you know what? There was a plan for them to attack in the march and Russia just make a first moment against them because their plan was uh and i, I believe there's a lot of evidences around already in writing and other evidences what ukrainian military and uh, as all was a part of this military was prepping to attack uh the donbass and to lead to the border with russia and to cut that republic and to make the how they call the filtration operation. So they established the concentration camp and holding them all active members. That was a brutal violation of Minsk agreement. That's they, why the Russia strike first. Because if the Russians understand the war is inevitable and they just want to have some tactical advances in this tactical superiority for moving, moving first. And they're not fighting against that Ukrainian population. That's all bullshit what's flying from Ukraine, all that fake news about Bucha massacre or about Kramatorsk rocket. That's all carefully constructed as an information influence operation against Russia in this war. Sooner or later, all these things will be debunked, but damage will be already done because 100% believe first in the fake news and right. only 10% of that people see that the debunking of this news as a fake. 
Well, so I don't know if you saw the, the NBC news report that came out uh, over the weekend, but the U.S. government, uh, U.S. government officials effect- effectively admitted to NBC News that they have been lying, that Russia was never planning a false flag attack, that it was never planning a chemical weapons attack, that it never sought weapons from China. Like they're, they're just putting out fake narratives as part of what they're calling yep. information. This is our intelligence in this. So our government officially uh, lying to us and they acknowledge in this. Yeah. We're not so dumb. We can we can make we can make we can connect the dots, because first of all, the Russians has no motivation because they want to keep Ukrainian population friendly to Russia. They have a very strict instruction how to fight that war to avoid the civilian casualties, and they never use the humans and civilians as a shield. Right. So the Ukrainians, because they have very little of military success, they use in everything just to cause more like you know publicity damage for russia yeah i mean I, I, like, like, i've seen photos of uh ukrainian tanks like on schoolyards and you know it, it just seems as yeah. though they're trying to it's get a lot russia of them. to you know what i need to say that we're working on a film currently we're working on a, another uh, film about ukraine and the uh, final confrontation so, so we we're trying to show all of this in that movie it's like very important uh, because that as soon as the all Russian source of information was cut off, like RT or the Russian state television or television or YouTube, even that that the pro-Russian the, the news was cut off, we was also censored shortly, but we fight back very strong and we was restored on YouTube, but we still limited, we still restricted. But I believe that alternative version of story, alternative vision different POV is very important because that's giving the audience ability to take, to look on the both sides and to make their own decision whom to believe. Well, and I definitely believe your film, Ukraine on Fire, I think that helps a lot of people, you know, put all this into context. It, it kind of goes over um, everything that, that we've discussed. Thank you. This uh, available on the YouTube, on the Rumble, available on Apple TV, and Amazon, and other 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 platforms. So watch Ukraine on Fire because it's definitely some kind of gem about what's leading to this situation, how Ukraine proceed to be the battlefield. And Igor, I did just have uh, one question from a patron. He just asks, uh, "How does it mm-hmm. feel? To, how did it feel to be working with Oliver Stone on U- Ukraine on Fire?" And that's from Ron. unbelievable. He's uh, he's uh, my master. He he teach me to direct. He pushed me to direct. He helped me. He threw in a trash can my first cut of Ukrainian fire because it was bad, and he helped me to make it better. We did four films with him. We did Snowden when I was executive producer. We did Ukrainian fire, revealing Ukraine, and we finished it. Uh, just finished it and start selling that big film about Eurasia called Kazakh History of the Golden Man. When he conducted an interview, our way of collaborate, usually he is my executive producer who lend in the name and helping me with the cut, with the final cut. And he has authority over the final cut. If he don't like something, I need to recut contractually. And he also conduct all interviews because he is very, very good on the interview with the, with the presidents or, or insiders or, the, or some, you know, people who, who are decision makers. And he's the greatest dramatist whom I know. So he understands the structure of drama very well. So Oliver, that's my blessing. It was best things what's happened in the movie industry to me. And, you know, uh, a film that I think you folks, uh, you know, should make, I think that would be a good follow-up to Snowden would, would be uh, a movie about Julian Assange, uh, especially considering the fact that he's being continually prosecuted. And by the way, for exposing war crimes so you know if you thought you know the the west was really against war crimes you figured they would let julian assange go since he exposed it or ask him to look into what happened uh in in buka yes but yeah uh, thank you yeah thank igor, you very again, much for I, me. igor again i really do appreciate you being on the show today for folks out there who would like to uh follow you uh online on social media how can they do that twitter my Twitter account, and I'm very much active on Twitter. I have a Telegram also, and I have a YouTube channel where all our movies are available. Well, thank you again, sir. I really do appreciate your time today, and hopefully I can have you back again at some point in the future. Thank you.